a uh, good holiday as best as you could. I know that uh, I believe God has great things in store for this new year. And I know sometimes when that's said, a lot of times uh, people mistakenly think that that means that we're not going to face things. Uh, I've, I've found the greater that God moves, the more the enemy tries to stop it, the more the enemy comes against us. And if you're facing a lot of things, sometimes that's because God has so much in store for your life that he's wanting to do. And the enemy has this desire to, to, to stop you. He's desired to, to come against you. But this morning I want to talk to us just for a little bit on the topic of crave. And uh, First Peter chapter 2 is going to be our anchor verses, uh, verses 1 through 3. And so I'm going to read, read those to you and then we're going to go into our introduction this morning, just kind of lay out the groundwork for this series. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-3 through 3 says, So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants longing for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. How many would testify that the Lord's good? Amen? Amen. That the Lord is good this morning. Um, the new year brings with it, uh, and last week I shared with you, we don't need a, a, re, a New Year's resolution, we need a revelation. But a lot of people make resolutions during the new year, what they're going to do. I'm going to eat more, I'm going to eat healthy. How many ever made that uh, a resolution? I'm going to eat healthy as you sat down to the plate of ribs or, you know, um, you know the pork chops. And, and starting tomorrow, I'm going to eat healthy. And, and then tomorrow ends up next year, starting, you know, 2019, I'm going to eat healthy. Um, well, all of us have done that. Uh, healthy eating, health, health foods, craving junk food. Let's try to experiment a little experiment. If I say uh, I am craving broccoli, Brussels sprouts, beets, and little tomatoes, how many of you would say, hmm? No, no, not many. But how many of you would say if I put, you know, I just don't work, does it, when you talk about craving. If I say I cra I'm craving chocolate, any amens? If I say I'm craving barbecue, pizza, hot wings, come on, steak, <laughs> yes, that sounds a little better. I, hardly ever do you see somebody walk by you and go, mmm, I got such a craving, you know, for uh, Brussels sprouts today. I got such a craving. No, our cravings usually are for the things that do not benefit us well. Amen? They're usually for the things that will cause harm if eaten without moderation. And so people crave different things. And guess what? People feed on what they crave. Amen. People feed on what they crave. Have you found that to be true in your life? You feed on what you crave. If you've got to have a Snickers bar and a Dr. Pepper on your way home from work every day, you probably will stop and get a Snickers bar and a Dr. Pepper on the way home. I don't know what your cravings may be, but people will feed their cravings. They will feed what they have. How many of you uh, ladies, when you, uh, uh, that you, you were pregnant with your children, had strange cravings? Any hands? Anybody had strange cravings? Only two ladies in the whole building. Not me. I just had. My wife's craving was crushed ice. She could not get enough of, we should have stock in Sonic, because every time I pass the Sonic, I get a bag of crushed ice, and I get a Route 44, one of the big cups of crushed ice, because she ate a lot of crushed ice when she was pregnant. That was her craving, was crushed ice. All right? She didn't have any really weird ones, but she, she but some people get weird cravings, okay? Guess what? Nothing would do but to feed that craving. I wonder how that applies to us spiritually. People feed what they crave. They feed on what tastes good to them, whether or not it is healthy for them, okay? Immature people are less concerned about balanced diet and healthiness and more concerned about the taste. Come on. But as you get older, you realize i got to be a little more concerned about what I eat if I want to be around a little longer. Okay, but when you're young, you don't care. You feed what you crave. And sometimes when you're older, you feed what you crave. And I'm here to tell you right now, you, if you're not careful, you will go out of your way. You will, you will do whatever it takes to feed your craving. 
<clears throat> so these verses turn around these two concepts. Only those who cut out the junk food in their spiritual diet can have a healthy appetite for nourishing soul food. And when I'm talking about soul food, I ain't talking about turnip greens and chitlins. I mean, you want something nourishing to your soul. And I'm here to tell you there's a lot of junk food for the spiritual man out there. And we're going to talk about some of that in a moment. Number two, only those who want nourishing food for their soul will process or or progress towards spiritual maturity. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care how long you have walked with God, all of us want to keep maturing in the Lord. Amen? We all have immature areas in our spiritual walk that we want to be more mature in. And God is wanting to help us with that in this year. Let us spend the bulk of our time this morning looking at the second verse. Verse 2 is our anchor verse. Like newborn infants longing for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Crave spiritual things. Crave spiritual food. This is the emphasis of this phrase. The phrase is usually translated in this way, the pure milk of the Word. We have all understood this to mean the Word of God. But before we get to that particular understanding, literally it should be translated, by the way, if you were to have a literal uh, translation of this, it would be wordy milk. Wordy milk. <laughs> this same word is used in Romans 12 too, to talk about worship. And, and it is usually translated reasonable. There is a reasonable service. Paul says in Romans 12 too, that this is your reasonable service. And the same words are used there. It comes from the root word that contains the word logos or word. It means word. It means thinking or reasoning. In other words, one of the things Peter wants us to do is he wants to encourage Encourage us to crave the things that will help us to grow in our understanding of God. I want you to know if we're we can we can have a, a walk with God that is that is insincere if we want it. We can stay as far away and just claim salvation if we want it. But I'm here to tell you what Peter and what the other apostles urged us to do throughout the Word of God is to develop a craving for more of knowledge of who He is, to want to be closer to Him. And I'm here to tell you, I believe that there's some of us in this room today, we have a deep craving for more than just a religious service. We have a deep craving for more than just three songs and offering a three-point sermon and go to the house. I'm here to tell you, God is wanting to fill that craving in our soul for something deeper than just a religious moment. He's wanting us to know that relationship with Him. Amen. Amen. Peter is urging us. He says, crave spiritual brain food. Crave crave those things that will make you think. Those things that will ponder uh, your thought process. Those things that will make you ponder and and consider the deeper things of God. He says, I want you to develop a craving. Too many Christians are satisfied with fluff. My wife came across a new recipe called fluff. What's in it? Marshmallows. Marshmallows cream cheese, pineapples, and it's this big fluffy mixture of sugar and fruit. Okay? Fluff. All right? Tina says it's great. Says the diabetic. (laughs) Fluff. But isn't, you know, (laughs) and as I was pondering the thoughts for this sermon, I kept thinking about that. I, I don't care for it. Okay? I don't like it. All right? You say, oh, I wouldn't tell my wife that. She'll never make it again. That's the idea. <laughs> Just kidding. Her and Peyton love it. Her and Peyton love it. But anyway, fluff. Fluff. And I got to thinking about that. Is, uh, Christianity is filled with fluff. Churches are filled with fluff. Think about it. Don't give me anything that's hard to chew. Don't give me anything that will cause me to leave here and think about it on Monday. Give me something fluffy, Pastor. Give me something that will satisfy the sugar craving in my heart and get me by and get me charged up for the moment. But then when I leave here, I won't have to think on it anymore. I'm here to tell you that will satisfy you for the moment, but it will not carry you through the week. It will never nourish you on a deeper level. If all you did is eat fluff all the time, I'm here to tell you something's going to happen in your life. You're going to get desperately sick. 
Your body's going to go without what it really needs to survive. You will not fulfill the nutrient needs if all you ate is pineapple and, and whatever and marshmallows and cream cheese. God's got deeper things in store for your experience than that. It's okay to have those things every now and then. I'm here to tell you, I believe all of us, every now and then, we need a good glass of spiritual milk and a spiritual Oreo. Amen. We need that. We need that good, feel-good moment every now and then. But I'm here to tell you what we are in desperate craving for is something that will help us to survive the pressures of life and the things that are going to derail us as we walk through our journey through this world. Amen. And I'm here to tell you things are out there that will knock you for a loop. They will derail your life and fluff will not get you through that. But I'm here to tell you if all you live for is the emotion, then you'll never truly be satisfied. But I'm here to tell you when you have found a deeper wall with God, when you have found trouble comes your way and you have tasted of the Lord and you know he is good, you'll find a place in your spiritual closet. You'll find a place alone with God and you'll cry out to him. I'm here to tell you if you've never done that, if you go through this fast and you do it right, you're going to find a place one of these moments, one of these days during this fast where you're crying out to God, I can't do this without you, God. I can't make it without you, God. I crave something deeper, something deeper than just fluff, than just fluff. The world is full of it. They're satisfied with the flamboyant they're satisfied with spiritual junk food. Peter challenges them to feast on the things that are healthy and have substance. If you want food that feeds your soul, it is going to have to be food that makes you think. Amen? It's going to have to have, it's going to have, to have something that draws you eventually to an altar of prayer. If it's food for the soul, it will convict the heart. Amen? If it's, that's the problem. See, when you just have fluff, people are moved for the moment, but they don't think about it when they leave. But I'm here to tell you what we need, as the spiritual old-timers called it. We need a spirit of old-time conviction moving in our church that will haunt us, that will get a hold of our life, that will make us realize, I can't survive on just the supercharged fluff. I need something deeper in God that will draw me to a relationship with Him. Amen, Pastor. This is what Hebrews 5, 11 through 14 means when it says, you people have been saved long enough. By now you should be chewing on solid food. But you have become dull of hearing and slow to understanding. And all you want is baby food. All you want is something easy. All you want is something, just tell me something good, Pastor, and I'll leave here feeling cheered up. I'm here to tell you right now, God is not a fan of pep rallies. He's not here just to build you up for the moment. God is here to build your endurance up to win the race that is set before you. I'm here to tell you, God has something in store for you in this coming year that's deeper than just an emotional experience. Amen. The literal reading of this, I paraphrase that first one is this, about this we have, such, uh, have so much to say, the writer of Hebrews said, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull in your hearing. He's saying, by now you should be hearing better, but you're not. For, the, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. The basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since uh, he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have the power of discernment trained by the constant practice to distinguish good from evil. You know what? You've got to work at telling what's good and what's not. You got to work at that, you know, because the devil is a deceiver. He'll deceive you into thinking ungodly things are okay. Amen? He'll, he'll, he'll deceive you in that. And you got to work at distingu distinguishing between the two and seeing, telling between the two. What are you saying? The author of Hebrews is saying, look, from this time, by this time, you ought to be teachers. You ought to be to the place where you're teaching others about Jesus, but you still need somebody to teach you the basics. 
I'm here to tell you, uh, and before we get too much further, I got to quote uh, a mentor in my life, which is Dr. Carden, better known as Bubba to those who know him. But Dr. Carden, uh, I love what he has to say when you preach things like this. It's great to have spiritual meat, but there still has to be milk in the house. Amen. We still have to have milk in the house. We all still need that good, refreshing glass of spiritual milk every now and then. But I'm here to tell you, if that's all you're living on, if all you can take is when the pastor's up talking about the love of God, 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 the love of God but he gets into do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs, and you get all clammed up, then you have not grown in the Lord. God's wanting us to grow this year. How about that? He's wanting you and I to become more than just someone has to be talked about, uh, you know, just tell me how much he loves me. Just tell me about his grace. But I'm here to tell you he is also a God of judgment. He is a God that one day we're going to stand before and we're going to hold account for the life that we live. And that's not popular and it don't always fill the house. But I'm here to tell you I'm convinced of something. Something the Lord has spoken to me over the last few months in, in my heart. That if we'll preach the truth there's a group of people that are starving for it and God's going to begin to draw them in to hear the truth of God's Word. I'm here to tell you I don't need fluff. I need somebody to help me on my journey. Amen. 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 Sometimes I need somebody to get up in my business. Amen. Now this is the fun part of my preaching. Look at somebody next to you. Point your finger at them and say, you need somebody to get up in your business. Come on. Come on. Tell them that. <laughs> Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. You need somebody to get up in your business. You need somebody that will call you and hold you accountable. You need somebody that will tell you when you're erring in your ways. Look, you've got to open yourself up for correction if you're going to walk with God. You may say, well, pastor, that's good and well. Who do you open? I've got plenty of people, believe it or not, that hold me accountable. I've got a lot of people that hold me accountable in my walk to God personally. I have them that hold me accountable in my walk with the Lord. One of them sitting on that front pew right there. And she is welcome to get up in my business. Why? Because I've got to have somebody that will do that. You've got to have somebody that will do that. And if you don't have somebody that will do that, my friend, I'm here to tell you, if, if the only friends you've got spiritually are those who constantly tell you, you okay? Oh, my goodness. I, I better come down here for this one. You know what? If all you've got is friends that will pat you on the back and say, you okay, God loves you, His grace has got you, His mercy has got you, I'm here to tell you we can use grace as an excuse to do whatever we want to do. That doesn't make it right. Amen? How many of you, your parents, your children have grace with you? You give them grace. Amen? Brian and Julia love that so much they just name one of their kids Grace. <laughs> you have grace. But how many parents realize that you can't constantly operate in grace? Sometimes there has to be correction. Amen? And here's the, here's the thing that stumps people. Do you realize you can correct with grace? It's not two separate things. Grace will correct me because grace is, a, is something that operates for my benefit in my walk with God. Mm -hmm. I've had friends of mine, when I'm telling them, just kind of venting off, having one of those moments, say, you know what? You don't really have a good spirit. What? My spirit's fine. No, it's not. Yeah. I'll talk to you later. And then the Lord began to convict me. Say, so, no, my spirit's not right. Amen. That's okay. Because I want to be more like Jesus. How about you? Yes. I don't want to be more like Phil this year. I want to be more like Jesus this year. And guess what? I've got to welcome myself for correction. I've got to welcome grace to come into my life and point out those things that are, I'm falling. Grace is there for the things that I can't do, those things I'm falling short in. doesn't mean I don't try. I don't put any effort forth. Grace is not a fire insurance policy. Oh, we're going to go on. I'm getting in deeper water. But then go back to the meaning we've been taught for many years that Peter is saying we need to feast on God's Word. We need to feast on the Bible. This is a legitimate translation uh, uh, on the context of the next few verses. I'm going to read those to you. In 
in First Peter, <coughs> excuse me, First Peter one, verse twenty three, it says this: Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but the imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. All right, what is he saying here? He said, you've been born again through the Word of God, through the declaration of His Word. Then he goes on, verse 25, if you want to read that with me, he says, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this Word is good news, that is the good news that was preached to you. What is he saying there? He reminds them that the Word of God is not a temporal thing. It doesn't last for just a moment, but it will help you endure to the end. I'm here to tell you right now, uh, how many realize that you can... You know, uh, you, you've got something to do in the morning, you, you're half asleep, and you tank up on a bunch of sugar. Will that get, help you get some energy? Yeah, sure will. But will it carry you very far? No. What do you have to have? You got to have something that is sustainable in your life. Our, my kids are into sports, and I tell them all the time you got to have some protein. You got to have something that will be a long burning fuel in your day, or you're not going to make it through. I'm here to tell you right now some Christians, what they get is they get a little spiritual fluff on Sunday morning, and then they burn out by Monday. They can't handle what's going on. What I want is I want God to infuse into our lives a little bit of protein. Amen. Spiritual. <laughs> nutrients that I can that I can maintain through the, 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 the whole week not just part of the week and by the way if the only time you're eating of the Word of God is here you are in trouble you are in trouble because this book needs to be partaken of on a daily basis you say I can't read it; it's too confusing I give up on it come see me Come see me. I want to help you with that. That's not in a judgmental way. That's in I want to help you. Because I'm here to tell you, a lot of times we don't read the Bible because we don't know how to read it. Amen. Or we're, trum we're stumbling through a translation that we can't understand. God wants you to understand His Word. How many believes that? Amen. Amen. All right. He goes on in verse two, chapter two, verse two. Same, First Peter. He says this. I want you to hear this. Like newborn infants, long for the uh, pure, for pure spiritual milk. There it is again. That by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Amen? He's saying, look, you've got to understand something. From now on, God wants you to grow up. God wants you to be strong in Him. So we should long to have the Word in our life. I'm here to tell you, if you're fasting and praying over these next 21 days, this is a time to become addicted to the Word of God. This is a time to realize that, that this Word is truly a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This Word is, is spiritual steak. This Word is spiritual potatoes. This Word is is substance that will carry me through my life. I need it in my life. Amen. Amen. Matthew 4.4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I'm here to tell you these are not just men's writings. This was the word of God written. As they wrote it down as the Holy Spirit gave them the inspiration. This is the living word of God. And when I read this, it's God talking to me. I like what some of our guys who went to a retreat said. They're learning to personalize the scripture. And a lot of times you need to do that. You need to put your name in there and realize that for God so loved Phil that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, so, so that if I, Phil, would believe in him, I would receive eternal life. I want you to know God did that for you. The Word is personal. The Word is personal. God wants you to be involved in what he's doing. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Lost my place. I got so excited. Everybody say, help in Jesus. It is the first day of the fast. <coughs> Amen. So he goes on and he talks about how we must develop a true craving in our hearts, a true craving in our souls for him. We have to have a craving for more than just what's on the surface. You know, when I was, when I emphasized to all of you, and you've heard me do this, uh, first of all, remember Peter was writing to people who didn't even have a written Bible. Okay? They didn't even have a written Bible in front of them. It is only the synagogues possessed any, any text at all. The, the average person didn't possess that. It is very possible that some of these people were even illiterate, didn't even know how to read. But that is an excuse. We've got the Bible now. We've got it in every form, every shape, every translation we could ever want, every language we could want it in. 
We've got Bibles to study. We've got Bible studies. We have translations that we can understand. We've got no excuses. There is spiritual food. I just want to share with you right now, God has a spiritual table spread in front of this church. He's got a spiritual table spread in front of your life. There's a buffet here, and he's saying all you got to do is sit down and eat of it every single day, and you're going to find life in you like you've never had before. Amen? There's a spiritual table spread for all of us. Amen. You and I, uh, or, you, or every one of you in this room have probably heard by now if you've been with, with us very long, that I emphasize the Word of God quite, quite a bit. And I even harass you to read it every day. <laughs> I tell you to get into Bible studies. I tell you to dig deeper. It's just because I care. Did you know that? What benefit do I get out of you reading your Bible? Okay? What benefit do I get out of you reading your Bible? Maybe a little less headache sometimes. That's just the truth. But the truth is, you're the one that benefits from it. And when you begin to grow up in the Lord, guess what? Then you're able to give away what you learn. You become a teacher of the Word. Amen? That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. This isn't medicine. <laughs> Did you understand that? The Bible isn't medicine. It is tasty and healthy and fulfilling. You've got to crave it. You've got to want it in your life. Jeremiah got it right. Jeremiah is a, is, is a preacher's preacher. Did you know that? Preachers love Jeremiah. I love Jeremiah. Why? Because we all think we can relate to him, even though none of us have yet have been thrown in a pit, but we all think we can relate to him. Jeremiah uh, preachers love this guy. Why? Because he was the greatest preacher of his time, and everybody hated his sermons. That gives me some hope. Amen. If you hate my sermons, that gives me hope. They didn't, they didn't hate him. <laughs> or they did. They hated him, but they finally hated him and his preaching so much they threw him in a pit. Anybody know that? Couldn't shut him up, though. So they just threw him in a mud hole and said, okay, preach to the pit. Preach to the walls. Nobody heard him, but he did say this. Are you ready for what Jeremiah said? This is awesome. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and a delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Here he is, I want you to imagine, down in a pit, some of us, you're in a pit in life. Let's just face it. Something's put you, you're trapped, you're, you're suffocated, you're looking and all you see is, a, is, is the walls of a mud pit. But this is what Jeremiah said, in the middle of my pit, I found your word and I ate them. And your words became joy and a delight to my heart. I'm here to tell you that's why I've been able to walk into somebody's room who has lost everything in life and then raise their hands and still praise God. That's why I've walked into a patient's room or a person's room and them drawing their last and dying breath and still raise a feeble hand and say to God be the glory. I just want to leave this world praising him. I want you to know there's something about that person. Person. They didn't find what they needed just in church. They found it when they were in the pits of life. They ate the Word of God, and it became a joy and a delight to their soul. I want you to know that is what's going to get you to heaven, not just knowing what I have to say to you, but knowing this book and the learning, it's a delight to the soul. Amen. A delight to the soul. Amen. Amen. Let me put it simple. I can challenge you this morning to examine your heart and your craving for the Word in your life. Because everything flows out of that. Absolutely everything. Somebody said, no, no, I don't believe everything flows out of my craving. I'm going to tell you right now, I've shared before, I don't know how to be a good pastor. But I read about the great shepherd, the good shepherd, and he does. I don't know how to be a good husband, but I got news for you. This book tells me how to be a good husband. I don't know how to be a good father at times, but this book tells me how to be a good father. I don't know how to be a good friend sometimes, but this book tells me how to be a good friend. Somebody says, I'm in business, and I, that has nothing to do. I got news for you. There are business principles in the Word of God. Did you know that? And when they are followed, I believe businesses will flourish. I believe God has placed within this book everything 
that we need to survive in this world. And I'm here to tell you, when we learn to eat it with delight, when we learn that it is healthy, that it is helping my spiritual man become massive in the eyes of God. We got a few guys in here that aren't strangers to the gym. Okay? They like to work out. And, you know, I watch them. I go to the same gym they go to, most of them. And they go, and they, they're lifting like, you know, I see them lifting all these huge weights, and I'm just on the treadmill because that's about all I can handle. I do good to get through that. <laughs> and I tell myself, you know, one day I'll go over there and I'll be lifting like they are, and then I'm going, eh. <laughs> I was talking with Eric today, and he was talking about all the different protein diets and different things he had been on and all the different shakes and all the different stuff. How many has ever participated in that? Raise your hand. And if you don't, you're lying. Okay. <laughs> uh, Why wow, you need that extra protein, you need that extra fuel for your muscles, those kind of things. And people who are really into that lifestyle, they read up on it and they know what works and they know what doesn't work. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be healthy, wanting to be strong. But what I'm trying to say is we can be the strongest person in this county and be the weakest person spiritually. I want God to fill your spiritual man with what's right. How about you? That you can face the enemy. <laughs> oh my goodness. You can face the enemy. Because I love this. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. His name was? Oh, two people know that. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and His name was? Jesus. All right, so Jesus is in my so the Word is in my heart. So what's in me is going to come out of me. Guess what? That means I can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil, and I can look at him eyeball-to-eyeball, -eyeball, and I can say with boldness and with confidence and with strength, I can look at him and say, Greater is he that is where? In me than he that is in this world. I've ingested life in me, and it's coming at you. Yes. It's coming at you. I've ingested strength in me, and it's coming at you. I've, in, I've ingested the power of God, and it's coming at you. It is called the life of Jesus living out in my life. Amen? Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you want? A few more points, and then we're done. We're going to baptize here in a moment. If you don't say, if you're sitting there saying you're satisfied where you're at, I'm going to tell you my prayer over you today is that God would begin to bring a craving in your soul that cannot be satisfied by anything but Him. A craving. 2018. It's hard to believe we're here. I closed my eyes. I was walking across a graduation field in Lumpkin County. 18 years old. Now, I'm not 18 anymore. Time is flying by. I closed my eyes. I was holding my infant son in my hands, and now he's going to be double digits this year. I closed my eyes, and I was holding my infant daughter in my hands, and she's going to get a learner's permit at the end of this year. Fair warning to all of you. Life is going by. And I say this with confidence. I refuse to say the best days are behind me. I look with hope that the best days are ahead of me. And I'm going to go ahead and say this. I refuse to say that the best days of the church is behind it. The best days of the church was the book of Acts. The best days of the church, times of miracles, wonders, and signs, that's the thing of the past. I refuse to say that that was all there was. I look with hope and anticipation, realizing the best days of the church are not behind it, but ahead of it. Because I see a craving forming in the body of Christ. Oh my goodness. I see a craving in people's hearts. I see a craving when, when, when people are texting me out of the blue, asking me, how can I grow closer to God? Don't even come to church here. Don't even attend church here. Life's knocked me down, Pastor, and life's hurt me. 
but I realize there's got to be more. I'm craving is what they're saying. What are you craving in your life? I love my family, love my kids, and love my wife. But I wouldn't have them if it wasn't for the Lord. Amen. So that causes me to crave something more, something deeper, something real. I'm going to ask you to stand. Where's your desire this morning? We got time. We got time. As we begin this 21 days, what is it you need God to do? What is it you desire to see the Lord do in your life, your family? What is it that you desire to see him do? Is it a craving? Is it a craving? I want you to think about something that you've craved in your physical life. Something you've went out of your way to satisfy that craving. When I was dating Tina, I lived in Macon, she lived in Jessup, and that was a three hour drive. I would be off preaching all over the country and I would get into my little place and, that I rented there in Macon and it'd be three in the morning, four in the morning. Hadn't seen her in a couple of weeks. And I'd look at the clock and I'd look at how tired I was, and I said, you know what? I can be there for breakfast. I'd get in my car, and I'd head to Jessup, and I'd meet her for breakfast. Why? Because, Brian, I craved to be with her. How far out of my way will I go to be with him? How much will I inconvenience myself to draw closer to Him? Do I crave the presence of God in my life? If that's you, I don't want you to care about whatever. The, you know why? Because I got news for you. You could have come to my house and said, don't go down there. I don't want you. I want you to stay and hang out with me. Uh-uh. I'm sorry. I'll see you later. I ain't seen my girlfriend in two weeks. I'm going to see, I'm going to see Tina. That's what I'd have said to you. Nothing would have stood in my way. But yet we let little things stand in our way about seeing God closer to us by what? Well, what will people think if I go to that altar today? What will they think? Who cares? Who cares? I, I could care less what people think about me. I could care less. I want him. I crave him. If that's you, then I want you to begin to make your way out of that seat and begin to find a place in this altar and start this year off right saying, God, I don't care what others think. I'm a, I got a craving, Lord, for you. I got to have you to face what's coming this year. I got to have you more than ever in my life. If that's you, slip out of your seat. Come on, find a place. Talk to God. Get his help. Oh, he's here. Guess what? The wonderful thing about him is he satisfies our cravings. He satisfies our desires and our longings. Amen. Just make some room. We can make room on this front pew if you're not praying, make room for them to pray. But everywhere you can, everywhere you can, just find a place, talk to God. Talk to God. Amen. I crave you, Lord. I crave your presence. God, I crave you. Amen. If there are others in this room, just come on. Come on. Come on. We got to have you. God. We got to have you this year, Lord. We can't do it without you, Lord. We can't make it without you. We crave for you, God. We crave for you in our family. We crave for you in our lives. Lord, I have a craving for you, Jesus. I have a craving for you. Amen. I have a craving for you.
Surrender. 